Hey guys, Garrett here. Today I want to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly on the plastic web ties within your ICF blocks. Now these ties are tasked to do several different things within your walls. The first thing that they are supposed to do is actually hold the foam in place so that when you fill it with concrete, the foam doesn't just blow out. And they do this very, very well. Today's designs with these are excellent. The second thing they are supposed to do is hold the rebar in place whenever you are stacking your block. And again, they do this perfectly. But it's the third thing that is my biggest beef. And honestly, there are ways to improve it or at least tips to live with it. The third thing it's supposed to be is your furring strips or your studs to be able to attach things to. And that'd be like your drywall or your cabinets or your siding or whatever veneer you're gonna put on the outside of the house. It needs to be able to hold those things in place. And honestly, it does an okay job. When you go to choose your blocks, I would say one of the most important things you can do is look at the web design within it. Now again, most of the webs are gonna be just fine for holding the foam together as well as holding the rebar in place, but it comes to the furring strip side of it where some shine a little brighter than the others. In my opinion, you're definitely gonna to wanna to have a block that has the furring strip that goes all the way from the top of the block all the way to the bottom of the block continuously. That way, whenever you're screwing things into those webs, you are less likely to find like a dead spot, one, a spot basically that uh, there is no plastic web. Now with all of these, there's gonna be a slight dead spot right where the two blocks meet, and it's just the nature of the beast, and there will be times where you hit that. It is frustrating, but you're just gonna have to move your screw either up or down just a little bit and you'll hit your webs. Most block manufacturers out there have a furring strip that is continuous from the top to the bottom and is the same thickness all the way through. But there is one that I definitely think is better and that's Build Block. They put a reinforced section, actually two of them, within each web. One that's near the top of the block and one that's near the bottom of the block. And these are double reinforced. They have a much higher pullout strength and they're just stronger overall. If you can get a block like this, whether it be build block or someone else that's doing the same thing, I would definitely go with that block over one that is consistent all the way through because honestly, the webs are just too darn thin. Most likely the web that you have is an inch and a half thick, just like a normal two by four. Now this sounds great, but the problem is, and let me demonstrate, when you hit a stud, you generally wanna to try to hit it right in the middle. But if you hit it a little bit off the middle or near the edge, it usually has enough strength to hold. That's not the case with the plastic webs. Take for example, this stir stick. The stir stick is actually thicker than what these webs are, but it gives a pretty good indication of what's gonna happen. So let's say you were putting a screw into this stir stick towards the outside quarter inch. Well, what's gonna happen? Most likely the wood on this side is going to bulge out or it's gonna break. The same thing happens with the plastic webs, except they don't generally bulge, they just break off. And so I would say that the outer quarter inch on each side of that plastic web is virtually worthless, except for drywall screws. Drywall screws are pretty thin and they, they just do pretty well within these furring strips, but any other type of screw, say like a construction screw or a deck screw or something like that, that has a pretty good thickness is probably going to break that stud. So a quarter inch on one side and a quarter inch on the other side, what that means is if it's an inch and a half thick, you only have really an inch of working space within it. Another factor is temperature. The colder plastic gets, the more brittle it gets as well. So this just exacerbates the problem at the edges of those plastic webs. On top of that, the plastic webs can actually deflect as you're putting a nail or a screw in place. So if you're going near the edge, it can actually make contact, push that plastic web back just a little bit and then deflect off and go onto the side. At that point, you're just gonna have to back your screw out 
and move it over to where it's more towards the center of that plastic web. And as I mentioned just a little bit ago, the screw size actually matters. So drywall screws are relatively thin. These plastic webs work great with thin screws, but when you get into a thicker screw, you're more apt to break the web itself especially if you were to get into say like a, a lag screw or something like that. I don't know that I'd put a lot of lag screws in these unless you have like build block and you have those reinforced spots. But regardless, I would still probably pre-drill it. Otherwise, you're probably just gonna split that entire web apart. Another downfall to these plastic webs are they are plastic, therefore their melting temperature is fairly low. So if you're like anyone else and you've taken a screw out of a board and you set it in your hand and then you quickly had to drop it because it was so hot. Well, when a screw gets that hot, it can actually melt those plastic webs after you've driven it through a board like this. Most of the time, it's not gonna get hot enough through one of these boards, but if you're using engineered lumber, and I was, I was using a bunch of engineered lumber, it has such a tight grain within it that it superheated these screws and by the time it hit that plastic web I had zero holding power because it completely melted it. So if you're going to use engineered wood there are two different things you can do to make it still made up to the ICF blocks. The first is you could pre-drill all of them and then run your screws through or you can run your screws through that board to where the tip of it is just hanging out do all the screws and then let them sit for about five minutes to where they cool down and then run it into these plastic webs. At that point, it shouldn't melt the webs. Another complaint with these plastic webs are that after you have the drywall up or you have your siding up or whatever it is, you don't know where those plastic webs are. You can't use a stud finder to find it like you would with normal traditional methods of building. So what do you need to do? Well, this all comes back to planning. Planning, 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 measuring, measuring, measuring. So before you go and put the sheetrock up, it's not a bad idea to have a reference point off of a wall to say, all right, I have a plastic web right here. Make yourself a schematic with all the different measurements in all of the different rooms. And then later on, you know exactly where those plastic webs are. You can attach whatever it is to the wall and you'll realize that that extra time that you took to make that schematic was completely and totally worth it. But when you do hang things on your wall, make sure they aren't too terribly heavy. Again, these are plastic webs. The manufacturers tout that they have the same pullout strength as lumber. Well, that's complete BS. In the real world, they don't. So regardless, put light things on those exterior walls that the ICF is on. You can put all your heavy things on interior walls. Just plan on that from the beginning. When it comes to attaching lap siding to your ICF blocks, the manufacturer recommends that you pre-drill through each piece and then screw it into these studs. And that's just fine. The problem with it is it takes forever. I say that there's another way and you can still use like a, a siding nailer with ring shank siding nails to do this and I prefer to blind nail all of my lap siding but I go one step further beyond that. So what is blind nailing? Well when you put a piece of siding up against the wall you nail across the top within that first inch and then you lap that siding over. Well, that lap covers those nail heads. So I do that as normal, but I take it one step further. Once I have nailed across the top, I take a construction adhesive just like this, which this one is Loctite's heavy duty adhesive. I have tried a bunch of different adhesives. I suggest the Loctite. I am not being sponsored by this. This works the best because these adhesives some of them will skin over really quick and then you don't get a nice bond between the two pieces of, of siding. I will take this, I will put a little dab on each of the nail heads that's going across that are then going to be covered by that next row. And then I just take my next piece of siding, put it in place, blind nail it along the top. Again, put little dabs of adhesive on each of the nail heads 
and it basically glues the two together. It not only glues the two pieces of siding together, it glues it to the nail head. Most blocks that you get are either gonna have a six inch web spacing or an eight inch web spacing. And if it's every eight inches, I would suggest putting a ring shake nail every single web. If it's six inches, I did it every other web, so I did it at one foot spacing. This has worked for me for my lap siding. Nothing has come off. We've had some serious winds come through and everything is exactly as it's supposed to be. Plus, I get that blind nail. I've noticed uh, whenever I have like my rental properties, that sort of stuff, I get rot around every single nail head. So I always prefer to blind nail everything. And even if I'm going into lumber, I use this same method with the adhesive. Another area where people are gonna get tripped up is when they go to install their baseboards. Pay attention here, this one is very, very important. You do not really nail much into these unless it's ring shank, but you can't really get ring shank brad or finish nails. So you have to do some more work up front. First, figure out what your baseboards are going to be. What's the profile, what's the height, specifically the height. So if you know you're gonna have a four inch tall baseboard and you know that your sheetrock is going to be a half inch thick, what you need to do is go get yourself some OSB or plywood that is half inch thick, rip strips of it. So if again, if it's a four inch baseboard, I would rip them at three inches tall. And then once you have those strips, go ahead and screw them in place at the bottom of your floor. The sheet rockers will come and hang all of the sheet rock. It'll just sit right on top of that OSB. And then you have something to shoot right through those baseboards and you have a product that will actually grip those nails. On the off chance that any manufacturer of an ICF block is watching, there are two ways that you can make your webs suck a heck of a lot less, and that is double the thickness of those plastic furring strips and make them two inches wide instead of an inch and a half wide. That then allows that last quarter inch on each side to still flake off whenever you hit it, but it gives you a true inch and a half that you can work with to attach things to. Hey guys, thanks again for watching. Make sure you subscribe down below, hit that like button as well, and let me know down below if there are any other topics within the ICF world that you would like to see. Keep in mind, I've already built my house, so there's only so much that I can show you, but I can talk all day long about this stuff. So let me know what you want to know. I'll see you guys next time.